Well, good morning. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming up. Good morning. Welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. Um, assuming uh, no one here has taken a, a wrong turn, you're, you're here to uh, participate in our event on uh, PRC interference in Taiwan's election, and we have an absolutely stellar group of individuals to help us unpack this really important and timely issue. I think especially so at a time of general and global democratic malaise, to put it politely, uh, Taiwan's democracy really stands out for its, its vibrancy. The presidential election that was just concluded in January had turnout of 74.9%, which when compared to turnout in the 2016 US presidential election of 60% of is really uh, quite astounding. And of course, Taiwan does not allow absentee ballots, so the percentage would have likely been uh, even higher. But at a time when Taiwan's democracy is flourishing, it's also coming under a sustained and, and concerted attack uh, from a number of uh, bad actors, but m most important is the People's Republic of China. Um, this, this comes to mind for me because, uh, I don't know about you, but I had some issues with Equifax and never quite knew who to blame until yesterday. Um, so this is now very personal for me. Um, but to really dive into this, we're going to uh, have a number of speakers and we're going to look at uh, both identifying what some of the problems are, what some of the methods and means are, but we're also going to have, I hope, a slightly optimistic discussion about what Taiwan is doing to improve the resiliency of its democracy while at the same time remaining a free and open society, which is going to be for all of us an important uh, balance to, to strike. Uh, so we've got a lot to get into today, and I don't want to uh, take it up with introductory remarks. So what I will do is I will turn it over to my colleague, uh, the director of the China Power Project, and a senior advisor for Asia here at CSIS, Bonnie Glazer, and I will give her the great honor of introducing our first speaker. After that, we'll then um, have a, uh, we'll do some rearranging here, and we'll come up for a, a group discussion with uh, two other experts, which I will introduce at the time. So right now I'm just going to invite uh, Bonnie to the stage and then uh, she will then invite up our, our first speaker. Well, good morning to everyone. Sorry that it's raining outside, but maybe be better rain than snow. And thank you all for coming. Um, you are all in for a treat uh, because we're going to have a terrific panel. But first, of course, we're going to have uh, our keynote speaker. And it really is a privilege uh, to have with us today uh, Minister Audrey Tang. Uh, uh, Minister Tang joined Taiwan's cabinet as a digital minister in October 2016. Um, and you probably all know that she uh, was at the time the youngest minister ever to be a uh, service minister in Taiwan. And she led Taiwan's first e-rulemaking project. And she uh, serves on the uh, Taiwan uh, National Development Council's Open Data Committee and K-12 Curriculum uh, Committee. Previously, Minister Tang worked as a consultant with Apple on computational logistics, uh, with Oxford University Press on crowd lexicography, and with social text on social interaction design. And if you all know what that means, you're way ahead of me. <laughs> so Minister Tang entered politics because, um, as I was doing some uh, reading about her background, uh, she believes that the real experts are the voters themselves, and they should have a role in the decision-making process, something that I fully endorse. She recognizes that people all over the world have lost trust in their governments. We certainly know that to be true in our own country. And she is trying to restore confidence in government in Taiwan. Minister Tang understands that digital means bringing government closer to the people. And she believes very strongly in the resilience of digital democracy. In her October 2019 op-ed for the New York Times, Minister Tang explained the many ways that Taiwan's government and tech community have collaborated. In Taiwan, she wrote, digital technology is boosting civic dialogue and infusing government with the spirit of social innovation. I have no doubt that this will continue under her leadership. So please join me in welcoming Taiwan's digital minister, Audrey Tang. Thank you. 
So, um, good morning, everyone, uh, and everyone online uh, from the great beyond, uh, that is the internet. Um, and let's see if this thing uh, works. So, um, just a little bit of uh, background. Uh, today, uh, while I'm going to talk about uh, PRC's interference, I'm going to focus more like between elections, because this is a day-to-day practice that we uh, face every day. Uh, and while I will touch upon some election-specific things, this is more about an uh, entire strategy to counter interference in general uh, with open governance. And so, um, how do I bring up the slides? OK, thank you. And then, Ah, here you go. Right, so that's my office, literally my office. Uh, it's the <coughs> uh, Social Innovation Lab in the Taipei City Center, and I'm there every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to the evening. Everybody can just walk in from the street because we tore down the walls. Uh, there used to be an Air Force HQ, uh, and everybody can just walk in and have 40 minutes of my time chatting about social innovation. The only thing I ask is that we publish the entire transcript online, um, and Nick here have done <laughs> quite a few times of that before. <laughs> I can read all about what we have talked online. Uh, and so this is just one of the examples of open government uh, practices in Taiwan, where we share the context of policy making, not just the what of the policies. And this is in stark contrast with nearby jurisdictions, uh, but also uh, in any, everywhere around Asia, according to the Civicus Monitor, uh, Taiwan is really the only jurisdiction with uh, the most open civic space. In every other jurisdiction in Asia, the minister's word is worth a little bit more than the journalists, but only in Taiwan the journalist's word is worth exactly the same as the minister's, and we intend to keep it that way. And so uh, we use, although the same um, Hans uh, Kanji uh, ideograph characters uh, as our nearby jurisdictions do, uh, they mean sometimes op opposite things. For example, we say Tomeng, and they say also Tomeng. But when we see, uh, say, transparency, we mean making the state radically transparent to the people, and sometimes they mean you know, making the citizens radically transparent to the state, uh, as with the social credit system. Uh, and when we see, say, co-creation with the private sector, uh, public-private partnership, we mean using sandboxes so that the private sector can propose novel regulations like self-driving vehicles, and we try and out for a year and see if the society likes it. Whereas uh, in the PRC, they mean that installing party branch in all the private sectors and control uh, using their party uh, membership. And so, like, same words, different interpretation. Um, and so, uh, so, now I really don't know <laughs> why the format goes a little bit off, but I hope that you can still read it. Um, the idea here uh, is that th today, when we're talking about interference, whether it's about fighter jets flying or about disinformation campaigns to sow discord, uh, it really, to me, is a projection not of power, but rather of uh, PRC's own insecurity of the st stabilization of their way of governing. And this insecurity, when projected in a kind of psychological projection way, uh, results in the kind of interference that you see on online uh, sowing discord. And because it uh, shares uh, on the social media via a narrative of insecurity, it tries to get people into this false sense of alarm, of moral panic, like you feel helpless because you feel angry about something that's not necessarily true, and the only way to get out of this helplessness is just to press share and kind of infect like two other people, and then maybe you feel better, uh, but then you have already infected two other people, and that is how those disinformation goes viral. Um, and so basically, uh, we're taking a fast response, rapid response strategy, so that um, at latest uh, two hours um is the maximum for all the ministries to respond with a mimetic package, uh, that is to say, something else that also goes viral that responds uh, to this disinformation. And usually, on average now, we do 60 minutes. So this is just one early example. Uh, this is our premier, our prime minister, Su Jin Chang. And at that time, there was a rumor that says, perming your hair multiple times within a week will result in a $1 million fine. It's, of course, not true. And within an hour, uh, this kind of mimetic engineering package rolls out that says, uh, I may be bought now now, says a young premier, uh, but I will not punish people with hair. And a fine printer says what we have done is introduce a laboring requirement that takes effect in 2021. And the premier, as he looks now, says, however, perming your hair many times a week will not damage your pocket, but it will damage your hair. And when serious, you may look like this. Um, and so it is like genuinely funny. Like, many of you laughed. <laughs> and once you laughed, uh, you're inoculated. Uh, it is impossible for you now to be motivated into sharing this angry disinformation 
exclamation message because the sense of anger has already turned into humor. And this is good humor. It's not making fun of any, anybody else. And so that is just one of the ways that we counter this kind of mimetic uh, virality of negative um, images and negative uh, disinformation using fun and humor. And so, but we don't call our, ourselves fact checkers. We're just contributing our part of the, you know, what we have observed. And it is the civil society, the journalistic the community, community that does the fact checking. And there's both the COFAX, which is crowdsourced. Everybody with a line account, which is like a WhatsApp, uh, can report anything that they suspect as spam, right? As something that weighs people's attention into something like the spam house. And then the international fact checking network, of which the Taiwan Fact Check Center is a member, can then go and do investigative journalism in the public and to clarify what, what is actually not true and to do the proper attribution. And of course, during elections, uh, we have special norm packages uh, with all the multinational com um, companies that says that because in, the ta in Taiwan, there's like a different branch called the control yuan, the control branch, that is separate from the judicial, legislative, and administrative that takes care of publishing all the campaign donation and expenses uh, in raw data form, like structured data, and everybody can just do an uh, independent analysis, analysis, much as uh, that, that these people did, this investigative journalist and data scientist did. And so we're saying, to uh, the global multinational uh, companies, uh, this is the norm in Taiwan, right? If uh, we detect through this uh, analysis that people who sponsor the advertisement on your platform don't go through the same uh, campaign donation expense uh, platform, then you probably should either a, stop running advertisements uh, concerning political issues during elections, or B, publish to exactly the same sense of real-time openness as our uh, control UN does, your choice. Right? So Facebook chose the, uh, the later and Google chose the former. And so I will now walk you through uh, three examples, one before, one during, and one after the election of how this works in practice. So before election, and that was around November, there was one really viral message that says, quote, Hong Kong thugs compensation exposed, killing a police and earn up to 20 million. Okay, uh, and and right, uh, and that is because uh, at that time the election is increasingly being shaped by the narratives around Hong Kong. Uh, PRC realized that if the Taiwan people, um, regardless of their partisan uh, affiliation, um, have sympathy with the Hong Kong people, their entire United Front uh, work may be lost. And so, uh, as soon as this goes viral, the Taiwan Fact Check Center devoted quite a few resources and looking into it, working with international counterparts in the journalism community, and found that the picture in question. Uh, attributing to the original um, version of the meme, uh, actually coming from the Reuters, and the Reuters says nothing about you know being paid or buying iPhones or uh, game consoles, brand names, sports shoes, or whatever. Uh, that's this mimetic payload is saying, and they trace this original post, the earliest post, to the public um, Weibo account of the Zhongyang Zhenfa Wei Chang'an Jian, or the Chang'an Sword of the Central um, Political and Legal um, Unit uh, of the Central. Um, CCP. Uh, and so this is uh, indeed state sponsored, and they're not even hiding it. This is not covert. This is very overt. And Puma will talk about some details uh, later. So, what we have done is notice and public notice. We make sure that everybody understands how the attribution works. We make sure that people on the social media, as well as on end to end encrypted channels, uh, can see this kind of fact check as a feedback whenever they try to share this link, like this has been fact checked. And Facebook also agreed, of course, to dial down the algorithm so that it's like moving to the spam folder so people don't see it as much. And during election, we see this one, which is very interesting. This is, uh, goes viral literally when people are still voting. Uh, this says, quote, the CIA made two special invisible ink for ballots. No matter how you vote, the one that you vote for Han will gradually fade, and the one that you vote for Tsai will gradually appear. Uh, this is very creative, isn't it? <laughs> Right, but it, it didn't really go super viral because uh, all the different partisan um, supporters, they can very easily go into the uh, tallying process because Taiwan use paper-based ballots. Uh, people are uh, YouTubers and they just uh, kind of film themselves watching how the ballots are being uh, displayed. And so if there is invisible inks appearing and disappearing, people will surely have found it in the online live streams. <laughs> and there's a app, actually multiple apps uh, from the different parties where they can report what they see in real time. And again, more participation, less chance of confusion, and less chance for this kind of disinformation to sow discord in the democratic process itself. And finally, and this is quite uh, recent, 
uh, early as last week, I think early uh, February, there's a trending rumor that says masks cannot be bought with money now. Uh, a certain manufacturer sponsored 2,000 boxes of masks. You can get a box for free by clicking share on this post. <laughs> Now, this is maybe kind of like a survey of the gullible people uh, in the population, <laughs> but, but this actually went viral, right? Um, and, and how do you actually counter this kind of disinformation? It is not something that fact-checking can work very reliably. So we designed a system where on that very day, February the 6th, uh, when the uh, fact-check goes out, that everybody can, using their phones, to check uh, exactly which pharmacies around them and the real-time stock uh, of the pharmacies and the masks that are stored. And we made sure that people can uh, ration uh, the mask using their national health uh, insurance cards. Uh, and so it is actually a uh, very versatile open data. By trusting citizens with the open data of the real time stock, there's more than 70 tools. And if you distrust all the 70 tool makers, you can make one yourself. Uh, and so people very easily see that masks are available or unavailable, depending on their vicinity. And uh, all the rumors around, like trying to lure people into getting free masks by sharing certain posts, uh, just stop being viral. And the good thing is that we can actually build dashboards, like for children's mask, what's the chance of you uh, procuring one today or, or now around this hour uh, for adults' masks uh, and uh, kind of histogram uh, of the number of currently available uh, surgical masks and things like that. And so because we uh, radically trust the citizens to do no uh, malicious things with these data, actually it enabled uh, the whole civil society to participate in innovative solutions to, uh, for rationing masks and other supplies during the coronavirus. And uh, that is uh, basically the takeaway uh, is that if you view uh, people who run interference campaigns as uh, just uh, weapons in a kind of warfare uh, metaphor, uh, you can easily lose the larger side of what is really shaping uh, the people's distrust. Because if people trust the, the democratic process by participating in it themselves, it is like a universal health coverage that they feel safe in the democratic process itself. And it is uh, a social technology that people can still innovate, uh, as I uh, showed with these examples. And so finally, I'd like to show you a, a small video that's played uh, a couple of days, uh, which serves like a kind of really good inoculation against all the divisive messages around election days that serves to unite people no matter what is the result after the election. I would also say that this plays some role uh, in mitigating the role of interference and uh, information warfare uh, during the elections. So please play the video. And that's my last slide. <laughs> Should I like do something? Or, <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Click one more over, like this. And then do I click play or? Ah, okay. And then one more. No, I, I think somebody is clicking for me. All right. This yeah. Authoritarians have been making a lot of noise, but this year, democracies have come together to make noise too. We stood by Taiwan. Under this pressure, it's not all I watch. This year, we saw the face of dictatorship, and we heard the roar of democracy. This year, we understood for the first time that no matter how different we might be, we all love our peaceful life here, and we all cherish this free, democratic country. Now, it's time for us to speak. The world is watching. What will Taiwan say? Please take another look at the peaceful life around you. Why do we deserve democracy and freedom? Please take another look at our children. The answer is in their eyes. Without hesitation, Taiwan will proclaim we choose to stand with democracy. We choose to stand with freedom. And we choose to stand with the world. On January 11th, let us find honor in our solidarity. Thank you.
So thank you, uh, Minister Tom, for all the important work uh, that you're doing. You know, I have um, my own personal experiences with um, disinformation about me mm -hmm. uh, online mm -hmm. in Taiwan. I have read them. <laughs> you have read them. <laughs> uh, there is a, an account of me that has details that says that I'm a CIA spy. Now, CIA seems to be very popular. Yes, it is very popular. <laughs> And this is on the line, which um, I'm not familiar with, but I know is very popular in Taiwan. And it's these, as I understand it, these sort of closed groups. So if you're not a member of the group, you can't mm -hmm. access that That's information. Fair. Fair. So I'll just grab the pointer <laughs> very quickly and scroll to the uh, pertinent. So how do, yeah, how do you deal with this particular <laughs> the, challenge when you have these closed this, groups? Yeah. Authoritarians no have been making a lot of noise, <laughs> but this, yeah, Trying to, democracies to have come the, together to make noise too. So, yeah. so, um, so, so there was a slide here uh, in the COFAX project uh, this year, where people asked we saw each other on the line platform, and it was a civic and project. And we heard the road. Just like uh, how people uh, will flag something as spun. Uh, mm -hmm. The initial prototype of the COFAX spot asked people to forward to the COFAX spot anything that they suspect as spam, so malinformation, information, disinformation, and so on. And that bot will publish that into a public database where um, a group of people, uh, civic tech people, uh, meeting every Wednesday or so, uh, will try to find the sources uh, that proves or disproves uh, that claim. And that, if it's trending, like reported by many people, mm -hmm. uh, the Taiwan Fact Check Center will take that as a priority to make a professional investigative journalist view uh, on it with the uh, sources supplied by the COFAX community. So it's like a crowdsourcing layer and a professional layer. And how long does it take before mm -hmm. a decision is reached and mm -hmm. then is the end result, I assume, it gets mm -hmm. taken down? Yeah, so uh, it doesn't or get taken democracy. down. Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> like, that like, took like, so like, long. Like, like much better. Uh, yeah, so, so it, it's, it's actually not a takedown. Uh, the important thing here is that um, it's a, as I say, uh, notice and public notice uh, idea. I see. Okay. So uh, what, what a takedown would mean uh, is actually it's more chance to sow discord because the okay. person who gets taken down can accuse the, for you know, censorship or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if you keep it up, but say in a very public notice uh, beneath it uh, that this is actually propaganda from the Zhongyang Zhenfa Wei Chang Jian, click here to learn mm -hmm. more. It empowers more people okay. to learn about the Reuters original story. Mm, interesting. So my sense from uh, my experience in uh, doing interviews with reporters from Taiwan you know, over the years is that uh, when I do interviews here in Washington, reporters generally ex respect the rules that we have. So if a person speaks, they say they're uh, talking on background or off the record. But when I go to Taiwan, not so much. Mm -hmm. um, and I find that I'm often misquoted or sometimes people mm -hmm. even fabricate mm -hmm. what I say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me this is to some extent a cultural mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. um, and Definitely. so it's a how, I'm, I'm assuming it, it's related to how mm -hmm. uh, journalists maybe are, are, are trained or mm -hmm. uh, maybe the way that people think about information. So what are the steps that you're taking to change this culture? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, it is true that uh, Taiwan's democracy in terms of, say, the presidential election uh, is the same year as when the World Web got popular. Uh, that was 1996. Um, and so from the very beginning, uh, the political campaigns have a much faster tempo uh, than a printed media age. And people very frequently quote out of context because it's very easy to do that in a digital way. Mm -hmm. It is actually easier to quote people out of context than preserving the context in the digital world. <laughs> <laughs> in the analog world, it's the, the other way around. Uh, and so I would say that the so-called real-time news uh, really contributes uh, to this um, kind of out of context norm that you're saying um, and uh, very often that institutional media will simply use a social media source uh, and simply say
say that, oh, people are saying that on social media and take that as kind of a fact-checked uh, report. Um, on the cable and the public spectrums uh, where the NCC uh, have to hand out licenses, when they get their licenses, they have to affirm that there's a certain steps of fact-checking is done before anything like that is published. But we detected uh, that it may be as short as 30 seconds. Um, mm -hmm. So if there is a way to do fact-checking across all the sources for 30 seconds, I really want to know about it. But, but <laughs> chances are that they skip that step. Uh, and so NCC is, uh, has been handing out fines, and it's gradually improved in the past year or so. Great. So what are the some of the steps you're going to take going forward in addition to what mm -hmm, you've done mm -hmm. so far? What are, you, what are you working on? Right. So the timely clarification, I think, really is the key. Uh, and we're going to improve both on the quality of the clarification, because the clarification like this, uh, you need a lot of essentially professional comedians uh, trying to roll <laughs> out uh, viral packages of messages. And it's uh, really a very time consuming uh, work. And what we will really uh, like in the uh, year, years coming uh, forward uh, is to send a kind of automatic attribution system so that we can detect uh, certain remixes of uh, messages such as uh, this one is actually from uh, which sources. And any source that looks like the one that uh, the John Jinfa Wei Chang has uh, produced in a kind of deep fake or synthetic message or whatever fashion automatically gets the same clarification as uh, we do for the original message. So we don't have to roll out the same clarification package for each variation uh, of the mimetic virus for like a, a better term. So that's, I think, one of the focus going forward. Great. Can you talk a little bit about um, the nature of PRC interference in um, mm -hmm. maybe a, compare a little bit, maybe sort of the local elections that took place and mm -hmm. then um, the, the um, presidential and legislative mm -hmm. election mm -hmm. um, and uh, how, what, what you're doing in, in mm -hmm. that regard, what are the methods that you're using to try to counter it? Right. Um, in, because in Taiwan, uh, the previous election, the mayoral one, uh, is the first one that coincides with a meaningful referendum. And what we have seen is that they kind of amplify each other because mm. each referendum is by nature a divisive issue uh, topic in the society. And it's very hard to tell whether someone is like genuinely argue for one side of the mm. referendum or whether they're participating in a disinformation campaign that tries to sow discord in the democratic process itself. And add to that, there are some mayoral candidates that are also proposers of referendums. And so it is actually very difficult to tell those two apart. Which is why after the mayor election we decided to run elections and referendum on alternating years. And so it's mm -hmm. now one year of presidential and then one year of national referendum and then one year of mayoral and one year of referendum. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, in the future what we will see is that during the referendum uh, if you're arguing for or against a particular topic, uh, for example a certain FTA agricultural agreement with the US, uh, then you probably <laughs> is part of the democratic <laughs> process. But if you're trying to attack the democratic process itself, like more invisible inks by the CIA, then you are probably <laughs> a, a, a foreign influence or at least foreign blessed uh, agent. It's easier to tell if you separate the issues uh, referenda with the people's which is election. Uh -huh. yeah. Great. Well, I want to open it up for uh, those of you who have some questions to ask Minister Tang. So please uh, identify yourself and wait till the microphone uh, comes to you and uh, ask a concise uh, question. So who would like to start? Okay, Charles Hutzler. Hi, uh, Charles Hutzler with the Wall Street Journal. I'm wondering, and I apologize, I came in a little late, so you may have addressed this uh, early in your remarks, but. Uh, in trying to sort out or tamp down disin online disinformation, what were your discussions, the government's discussions, like with Facebook? Mm -hmm. um, what details can you provide on that? How helpful were they? And did the political parties themselves also have separate channels to Facebook as well to uh, address disinformation? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so to your second question, I'm not politically affiliated with any party, except with a very small party called a Very Happy Party, or literally <laughs> can't stop this party. Uh, all the four <laughs> founding members are professional comedians and YouTubers, uh, but they don't run in the legislative, so uh, we're, we're free uh, this time. But in any case, um, so uh, from the cabinet, uh, we talk with Facebook uh, and such, uh, basically using what we call a norm-first approach. So uh, I explained that we have a norm, that we have a separate branch in the Constitution dealing with campaign financing, including donation and expense. And the norm around the mayor election is that the control yuan publishes the raw data for independent journalists and data scientists to analyze. And what they have done is kind of record level. It's not an aggregate or statistics. And so we tell Facebook and friends that this is the norm here. So you either sign upon this counter disinformation norm package, which they eventually signed on, and provide the same insight or transparency, or you don't run political ads altogether because this is the norm for our control yuan and this should be the norm that a society is expecting mm -hmm. from you. So if you don't follow through on those norms, you may face social sanction and really there's nothing uh, stronger than social sanction in Taiwan. Uh, and so uh, <laughs> basically we take a social norm first approach to talk with the multinational company and they eventually uh, really uh, take that very seriously and set up warrants during uh, the elections. I don't really know about the individual parties. Uh, was it your office that carried out the, uh, the conversation with mm -hmm. Facebook, or was mm -hmm. it a set of which office in the government? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, as the digital minister, uh, it's really part of my role to kind of the semi-ambassadorship to semi-sovereign entities uh, and uh, who are issuing their own currency as we speak. Uh, so basically uh, what uh, I'm trying to do is acting in a more diplomatic way rather than kind of passing anything like the SDG or things like that. Uh, we were saying that we may be forced by the civil society to pass something like the SDG if you don't work with the fact-checking ecosystem and the journalistic community. So it is my role and uh, I usually go about it in a what we call multi-stakeholderism kind of way. Yeah. Yes, over here. Hi, uh, my name is Kazu Koyama. I'm with CrowdStrike Intelligence. Uh, my question is, uh, well, from my understanding, uh, Taiwan is also a very serious source of, of disinformation. There are, for example, reportedly uh, online content farms that try to generate uh, fake news to gain online traffic uh, and uh, gain, uh, you know, try to make money off of that. There are also uh, entities such as, uh, uh, excuse me, it's okay. sorry, uh, there are also uh, internet armies that reportedly also back uh, political parties. So how do you try to determine between uh, Chinese origins and Taiwanese origins of disinformation? And also, in those cases that you've determined are Chinese origins, how do you know which apparatus uh, it has come from? For example, United Front, uh, Taiwan Affairs Office, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> so it's actually two questions. Um, so about the um, kind of attribution to particular organs, uh, within uh, PRC, whether they're state-sponsored or merely state-blessed by opening them, you know, special non-VPN accounts uh, to get direct access to Twitter. Um, that is actually Puma's specialty. <laughs> so I will uh, defer to, to Professor Shen uh, in his panel uh, to answer that part of the operational uh, question. But truly, of course, there are any number of content farms that produce, um, I, in Taiwan, we don't use the F word, uh, the, the fake news word, uh, because, <laughs> <laughs> right, be, because uh, we, we said disinformation, and it has a legal definition, which is uh, intentional untruths that harms the public. So not harming the image of a minister, which is just good journalism. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, otherwise, <laughs> you can't really tell uh, news, which is translated as xinwen, and journalism, which is translated as xinwen gongzuo. Right? It, it's the same word. Uh, journalism is literally news work. So there's really no way to say the F word without offending journalists. And both my parents are journalists, so out of filial piety, I can't say the <laughs> F word. So, <laughs> so, so, but, but this actually draws the line, right? Uh, it's one thing about content farms uh, earning commercial profit. It is another thing about intentionally spreading things that harms 
the public, no matter whether it's about the democratic uh, process or about the health. Uh, and uh, this rapid response system only goes into effect within the ministry if it is uh, for public harm. Although independent fact checkers, of course, uh, mostly fact check things that are related to food safety. Yeah. Yes. yes, here in front. Hi, uh, Jane Tang, same last name, with Radio Free Asia in DC. Um, my question maybe is for Bonnie and uh, Ms. Yeah. Tan, uh, Mrs. Tang as well. How do you find the similarity and the difference between uh, Russian interference into the US election between and then the t PRC interference to Taiwan election? What's the similarity or difference? I think generally, if you look at um, uh, the way that Russia interferes in uh, elections, it tends to be more targeted and it tends to be more sort of operational. Um, uh, what we have seen from China in the past uh, in our own country and in other places, um, I think is more about shaping the narrative. Um, I don't think, um, and you know, mm -hmm. Minister Tang may have mm -hmm. other ideas, mm -hmm. but uh, it tends to be about creating an environment in which China's perspective, it prevails, um, influences the way people think, um, but not so much about entering a particular, um, uh, like, like voting machines, for example, uh, to try and actually change um, the, the outcome. So I think it's different techniques. Um, I myself wonder whether uh, the Chinese and the Russians are going to learn from each other, mm -hmm. coordinate, mm -hmm. share information because they are doing so in other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know whether they have done so uh, so far. But when we look at our own elections here in the United States, and you can look recently back in 2016, there appears to be um, incontrovertible evidence that the Russians interfered mm -hmm. uh, in our elections. But I think that that kind of, uh, of the techniques that they use, I don't think we saw the Chinese using those kind of techniques. Yeah, and the civil society, no matter in the U.S. or in Taiwan's expectation of Facebook and other multinational uh, social media companies have really changed in the past four years. Whereas four years ago, they can argue uh, that they're mere conduits and get away with it. Uh, really, nowadays, everybody expects them to be co-governance uh, with essentially the same accountability requirements as any other governing organization because they are actively shaping um, online opinion themselves with algorithms. And so uh, I would also say the old playbook uh, that worked in 2016, even though they may very well have been sharing it, uh, is of less uh, effect uh, in the year 2020, uh, simply because that uh, all these venues that relies on the um, multinational platforms holding a mere conduit um, manner doesn't work anymore. They are actively or passively or being pressured into, but in any way, collaborating with the fact-checking and the civil society around investment of journalists and empowering everybody to be a potential journalist is I think uh, what a common solution looks like both in Taiwan where we start teaching about media competence as early as first grade uh, as everywhere in the world. Yeah. More questions? Yes, over here. Good morning, thank you so much to both of you. Tyler Walker, Johns Hopkins Science, good to see you again, Minister Tang. Uh, we met in Taiwan. Uh, this is a question for both of you. If you could, uh, based on the election that just happened and going forward, kind of provide what you think would be more impactful, uh, disinformation through the uh, social media landscape, through Facebook, uh, what you're combating with the Taiwan Fact Check Center, or disinformation through conventional media outlets that might have more of a pro-Beijing uh, outlook on things. They, they do amplify each other, though. Um, uh, sorry? They do amplify each other. That, that's what um, Bonnie was talking about, is that there is a kind of no time gap between something appearing on social media and something gets repeated 
on institutional media, on some institutional media, and uh, also the other way around. And so uh, just making sure that there is a fair uh, bit of time between these two kinds of flows, uh, between the social media and the institutional media, and more people participating in the cross-check as a lot of uh, institutional media team together during the presidential debates and platforms to fact-check with thousands of volunteers every single sentence that the presidential candidates have said and, and just color them as kind of a personal opinion uh, or fact or non-fact and so on. Uh, it really provides it a much more legitimacy and much needed legitimacy uh, to institutional media in the age uh, of the digital and also that they can do this uh, with a uh, more, uh, we are the social media, we're not uh, playing in existing social media rules, uh, we're actually engaging our readership in an active way by maintaining our own social media to uh, get people's more convergent views on news rather than the most divergent uh, views on news. And that, I think, is also one of the main uh, inventions uh, to look in the uh, future years, is that people using social media to get a rough consensus of what it feels like in the policy, rather than just to keep people uh, looking at advertisements. Given that you're using all of these um, tools to try to counter disinformation, mm -hmm. do you expect or already see that the PRC is changing mm -hmm. the way that they're actually trying to influence opinions in Taiwan because they see that there is, um, it, it's more difficult for them to be effective because of these measures that you're taking. Yeah, um, so like generally speaking, uh, YouTube plays a larger role in the presidential election than it did um, in the mayoral, where Facebook uh, has a much larger role uh, in it mm -hmm. to play. Uh, mm -hmm. But a quantitative person is Puma again. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we'll talk about it uh, in the panel. Okay, all right, Because great. I preview his slides, you see. Okay, <laughs> all right, good, good. We don't want to take away his thunder. Right. Uh, we'll give him a chance later on. Um, other questions? Yes, over here. Hi, this is um, Kyung Tae Hwang from South Korea. And, um, and thanks for your speech. And there is a rumor, actually, there are lots of protests in Korea. So um, I'm not sure, but there's a rumor is, uh, that protest is sponsored by the PRC. So um, I'm not sure about it, but it, I think it, it could be. And uh, so um, recently, I, while I, um, I'm researching the uh, blockchain and the Hong Kong's political situation, I uh, believe that I kind of we make alliance to protect uh, democracy in the Asian countries like Taiwan, Hong Kong, probably um, Korea and Japan. So um, I, don't, I don't like the conspiracy because of Russia and China, but um, to protect our liberties. So, uh, how about for us to make a small alliance and civil society among the, these countries? So, I want, uh, yeah. yeah. The, the COVAX uh, community uh, is actually part of the GovZero movement. And the GovZero movement is very active working with uh, the South Korean and the Japanese. They actually had a hackathon together at Okinawa because it's mm -hmm. like same distance. Right? Uh, and so um, this is, I think, really good that the ideas of, the, for example, Kofax uh, is already spreading because it's open source. Anybody can just download and try it out in their local social configuration. If their local social configuration doesn't allow them to safe fact check certain political statements, at least they can check for the food safety uh, or coronavirus uh, statements. And so if you take cofact.org and remove the S, so it's singular, cofact.org, you actually get into the Thai version of cofact. And, and this uh, says that a lot of this technique uh, is not specific to any jurisdiction. As soon as we publish these techniques online, you don't have to ask for a license or patents or whatever. You can just start rolling out this kind of solutions within your own jurisdiction uh, that works with your own, your own local media and your own, own local group. And this is the, the best way because Taiwan doesn't want to be kind of like, you know, colonizing uh, shares of uh, non-open innovations. And, um, and I really think that this kind of open innovation in the civil society is the best because otherwise it will be the Taiwanese administration kind of dictating the fact checkers uh, in other jurisdictions that we don't want to play that role. Can you talk a little bit about how Taiwan and the U.S. Um, are working together, mm -hmm. either governments or civil societies mm -hmm. in this space? Yes. So. Um, 
um, actually, very quickly, uh, we'll have a tech challenge uh, in Taipei uh, that look at the post-election numbers, uh, data, and things like that, and invite everywhere um, around Asia and the Pacific and the Indonesian uh, oceans, uh, and who will have uh, any um, new insights into the data that was gathered uh, during Taiwan's, but also other democratic countries' uh, elections. And the uh, winners of the tech challenge uh, will get a lot of exposure to all the uh, future uh, democratic elections that's going to be held uh, around that region. And that is just one of the many, uh, what we call the global cooperation and training framework uh, results between uh, US and Taiwan and Japan. It's important to say all three because it's now a mini lateral. And for each GCTF, we also pull in the fourth uh, sponsor. For example, uh, in the one that around sustainable uh, asset management around marine debris and so on, Netherlands join. Uh, and so depending on the topic, we will also bring other jurisdictions uh, to play and share the playbooks between uh, ours. And so um, any place in the Civicus Monitor that doesn't uh, restrict the civic space, we're really happy to share our methodologies and run workshops together. Yeah. That's great. Terrific. Other questions? OK, well, um, we will, in a few minutes, we'll move to our uh, our panel, so you just have to give us a minute or two to rearrange the furniture. So please join me in thanking Minister Audrey Tang.
to uh, start returning to your seats, please. Yeah. So, Pumi, you actually. So, uh, so for the next portion of our discussion today, we're going to be focusing at a much more granular level on some of the issues that uh, Mr. Tong talked about with two really outstanding, uh, outstanding people and the ex top experts in the field here. So this is going to be a good opportunity to uh, get in the weeds uh, on this. So uh, on my far right, we've got Puma Shun, who's an assistant professor of criminology at National Taipei University and the director of the Double Think Labs, which is a research organization dedicated to monitoring uh, disinformation networks in Taiwan. Uh, in the middle here, we've got Nick Monaco, who's research, uh, research director of the Digital Intelligence Lab at the Institute for the Future. That is all one title designed to show you how smart Nick is. Um, so Nick looks at global online disinformation and political manipulation and himself has done some really exciting work on Taiwan's uh, political information ecosystem. So what we'll do is, well, I'll ask, um, after I sit down, we'll ask each of them uh, one at a time to come up and give their uh, presentation remarks. First, we'll ask, ask Puma, and then when Puma's done, Nick will come up to the stage, and then we'll hear some um, remarks by my colleague, uh, Bonnie, at which point we'll get into, uh, we'll into Q&A. So with that, I will welcome up to the stage, Puma. Ready, huh? So hi everyone, I'm, it's really my pleasure to present my work today, and it's a lot of thunder on me right now, I'm kind of nervous, but I really want to thank CSIS for hosting this event. So uh, my presentation will be like three parts. First, I'll talk about the coronavirus because I think it serves as a very, the best example of how Chinese information warfare operates. And then I'll talk about some suspicious activities we have seen like during the election. And then we'll talk about, I mean, most people are more interested in how we attribute that to uh, Chinese or to, to China or the Chinese department. So should I click? Oh, okay. Oh, it's right here. Oh, okay, that's me, Puma Shen. Okay. So, so, <laughs> so I would like to begin with the, the example here. So coronavirus has spread like around China, you as you already know, and there are like uh, three rumors I want to illustrate here. So this is the first one talking about the flu. So they said that the flu caused 6,600 6, deaths in the U.S., so which implies that compared to China, uh, the U.S. is weaker in dealing with all this kind of virus. So this rumor spread from one of the Weibo account, as you can see here. We mon uh, that, that's one of the account we monitor. And it spread all over to the content farm in two days. So this is the second one. It's talking about how the US created the virus in China because it wants to, uh, it wants to destroy China. So they say they're talking about like, whether this uh, virus is like, uh, designed as the targeting Chinese DNA. So this rumor only spread among certain groups of people, but it's still like, effective. So these two rumors were created to try to turn attention from China to the U.S. and building public confidence in the Chinese government. But they have only limited effects on people who are not Chinese or in the Western world. So, however, the third rumor I want to illustrate here shows that the Chinese information can also have sophisticated and widespread effects. So the third rumor here is about the deaths around the world. So, they, uh, so it, it says that people die from HIV and they die from other kinds of virus too. So this rumor first came out from Weibo again, but it did not go through the content from. And actually no content from we monitor disseminates this rumor. Chinese netizens actually even laugh at this comparison. So despite this channels it has taken, I mean this rumor has had like but it has had a great effects in Taiwan, not in China. So YouTubers and broadcasters who live stream often shared this information on their Facebook and Twitter accounts with, uh, with exact the same messages a few hours after it first became available. So some of them belong to the same company that has connection with China. And within a day, this rumor spread to the uh, private, private P2P messaging groups in Taiwan, as did the first two rumors I mentioned. And 70% of the spread on Facebook is from Han Guo Yu, uh, one of the uh, president candidate, uh, you already know that, okay, the supporters group. So the, so the next day, the political talk show in Taiwan started to denounce the government, saying that if we block Chinese people from entering, we need to block Americans because of the flu. 
So this is, and this is the P, uh, private to private messaging rumors that we collect for the last 48 hours, so it's pretty fresh. So within the top 10 messages we collected in all this closed group, five of them is about coronavirus, and three of them are from China. And the concentration rate on this kind of fake news is much higher than any other social media platform right now. So I think this is a great example of like Chinese information warfare, and there are like several things I think we can learn from this. First is that we often talk about attribution, but attribution is more sophisticated than we think. The Chinese government itself does not need to be involved. There are many capital seekers in China who try to climb up, uh, you know, up the ladder to acquire political capital, and they often produce this information to feed the central government's propaganda. And in addition to the political elites who try to seek all these kind of political capital. There are patriots too. And they produce this information for the sake of passion. So the HIV example I mentioned is produced by patriots, not by the central government. And the next question is that, how can it be influential? This leads to the next crucial points in the Chinese disinformation warfare. It is not that the producers and creators of this information matter. It is the disseminators that matter. So in the example I just provided, it is the YouTubers bribed or seduced by the Chinese market power that matter because they are the ones capable of re uh, reaching the target audience in Taiwan and also in other countries. They are not capable of producing this information. But that is not an issue here since it is very easy for them to pick up this information from Weibo, from WeChat, or even TikTok. So this is what I call the decoupling process between the produ production and distribution. And therefore, to, I mean, to simply investigate the source of the disinformation in China is far from enough. And what is more important here is what I listed here is the middleman who connect the producers and the disseminators. So let me illustrate like what we have, uh, the tools we have to monitor all this kind of stuff, and then I'll jump to the suspicious activities and attribution stuff. So uh, we have collected information from 207 suspicious fan pages and groups on Facebook, and we have uh, archived Weibo accounts, WeChat public accounts, YouTube channels, BBS forum articles, and other content from articles as well. And we have also asked more than 20,000 people to report suspicious messages they received uh, from the private messaging group, and we will receive more than 3,000 messages per day. But right now, I mean, uh, starting from last weekend, we, we got like 5,000 per day. And actually, when uh, Minis Tang was presenting, I got like 600 more like messages here. So it's all about coronavirus. So furthermore, we collaborate with investigators to trace the actions of people who spread the disinformation offline. I mean, uh, actually who people who live there in Taiwanese society. And we also have a comprehensive picture of all the departments, offices, and NGOs are responsible, that, uh, responsible for all these Taiwan affairs, which can help us define the Chinese disinformation chain. So when we talk about suspiciousness, we define it uh, by using several standards. So for example, a Facebook account is suspicious if the language being used by the account changes several times, or the account's profile picture get fewer likes than his or her uh, normal post. And sometimes the posts have no comments, but lots of likes, or vice versa. And this also applies to YouTube channels. Uh, for example, a channel can have only like 5,000 subscribers, but, on, but can have more than 100,000 views during a live stream. So, I mean, that's suspiciousness for me. So all these are the, uh, so I talk about the online, so I'll move to the, all these suspicious activities we saw. And so the first one in general, let's look at the big data. Although people may criticize the idea that DPP has its own cyber force and creates all this online volume, but as you can see here, it cannot be compared to another party, the, the Hans on, on the, the volume online, and it could reach 60% of the social media volume for and lasting for like six months. Like even the death of Kobe Bryant cannot reach that standard. So that so the question is that who contributes this skewed data? So first I'll talk about Facebook. So some suspiciousness can be seen on Facebook. For example, lots of fan pages and groups on the right, they would share the content from articles on the left that are pro-China or hatred generating. As you can see in the graph, the connection between certain content forms and fan pages are very clear, since they are operated by the same group of people, actually. And we spot, actually, there are like four families operating this kind of business. And when we compare all these suspicious fan pages uh, and with the people Daily and Hello Taiwan. Hello Taiwan is one of the 
website operated by Taiwan Face Office. So we can see that the inter interaction rate for the two groups are actually related. And take another like uh, fan pages here. So here's a fan page there, for example. It's a fan page that teaches everyday English and the oven in Taiwan. And the oven posts articles during commute time because they are targeting students. However, after July 2019, the fan page stopped posting articles in the morning and only focused on nighttime. Also the time when the fan page turns into a political one. It still teaches English, but it uses it denouncing DPP related disinformation as examples. So all these like suspicious activities we could see on Facebook, part of them could be attributed to China and I'll talk about that later. And here's the YouTube. And so addition to the Chinese YouTubers because they are easy to discern, Taiwanese YouTubers play a much more uh, sophisticated role here. So as the graph on the upper right shows, certain YouTuber subscribers grew certainly in mid-October. Their live streams attracted disproportionately high view counts before the election. And three of them closed after the, I mean closed their channel after the anti-infiltration law was passed at the end of December. So these YouTubers have been engaged in several suspicious activities. For example, during the live streaming, most YouTubers use the same third-party payment company. And as you can see on the upper left, some of them provide WeChat and Alipay QR codes for donations. It's kind of weird because you're doing live stream in Taiwan, but you're providing the donation link for China. So as a matter of, because you need a Chinese bank account to donate via WeChat or Alipay, but most Taiwanese people do not use this kind of service. And then, and this is what happened on IG and Twitter. So there were, was a wave of people on Instagram in December putting their hand on their chest like this, denouncing the government and talking about how they were going to vote. So this might look like an organic uh, phenomenon, but as, China, uh, as Taiwanese, we can see that their linguistic usage is kind of weird because they are using the hashtag saying that declaring, declaring my vote intention. So this is not the way we talk. So the hashtag we, we was widely distributed on IG Twitter, but due to Taiwanese NGO's effort, the effort was stopped like within a day. And I'll talk about the company behind that later. So all these Facebook, YouTube, IG, Twitter do not depict the whole picture of this information since the private to private, I mean the, the P2P uh, messaging system, uh, similar to the WeChat here. Oh, not the WeChat, uh, WhatsApp. So the graph below, I mean, on the upper left, indicates the rumors that we collect from the P2P report system. So as you can see here, there are both highs and lows of common information distribution. However, certain political messages distribute information significantly different uh, uh, from other kinds of rumors. So for example, the first graph that I, on the upper left indicates the rumor talking about how DPP has a debt of six trillion, and it's actually a rumor from Hong Kong. So, so the, the message is in simplified Chinese, and it actually has a political link that links to China. And during this, the election, these kinds of abnormal distribution of information appears two times more than the disinformation we collected in 2018. And it's interesting that one of the line groups we monitor, uh, it's just a side story, but I'll share that with you. So one of the line chat group, the line is the P2P uh, messaging group that we use. So it has like 200 members in it, in the, in, the, in the chat group. But right after the election day, 160 members withdrew from the group, and which means that only 40 of them are real Taiwanese people who voluntarily joined the group. And those people constantly read this information on their cell phone that is distributed by people they do not even know. And 16 billion, there are 16 million people use line in Taiwan. And guess how many messages per day were sent and received last year? per day. We got 10 billion messages per day sent and received in Taiwan. So most of these messages could be disinformation and junk news. And this is the scope of the challenge we face right now. As also you can see the topic here in the P2P system, they changed over time um, um, as the graphic indicates. So in different periods, the rumor changes its forms. So I can, I can talk about that during the Q&A because it's a lot complicated. And then the last suspicious activity I want to mention is the offline. So traditional rumors still play a role here. For example, the temple system in Taiwan has largely been affected by China. And the free fortune calendars started to promote uh, pro-China messages in October 2019. With these messages saying things such as Shanghai terrorists come to Taiwan, order a lot of street food, um, uh, don't believe in DPP and Tsai, follow Han, Kaohsiung should implement the uh, 92 consensus, China will test its nuclear weapons, China will unify Taiwan by the 
for, uh, by force in 2020, which is this year, I guess. So, so other similar rumors can also be found in local religious activities. So all these are the suspicious activities that we have been collecting, and there are more. I mean, every day there are like disinformation from, I mean, the other side. But it is rather difficult to attribute all this disinformation attacks to China. However, as I indicated, this is not only about this information production, but also about who reproduce, amplifies, and distribute the information. So since they don't have to produce the disinformation, they just amplify the disinformation that we already have produced locally here. So some examples are easy to analyze, like the temple example. The temple can be, I mean, some of the temple and actually who print all this kind of stuff can be easily traced to the association connected to China with the United Front War Department. Well, like some YouTube videos is actually from China. But for other cases, we need a detailed model. And this is the one I created, but, um, oh, I mean, this is a, this is a rather complicated one. Maybe I'll talk about that during the Q&A too. But this is the, um, this is the graph that I try to indicate all the nodes, like within the government, or the NGOs, or all these uh, people, and uh, all the people, organizations, that could disseminate this information around the world, and especially in Taiwan, and in the Chinese case. So the great example comes from the work of content from, let me introduce that. So previously, companies it's like Wu Wei. Wu Wei company is actually from Beijing, Qinghuangdao. So they operate content farms and fan pages, and they simultaneously would distribute this information whenever they produce any disinformation on their website and will put that on Facebook. However, these companies have changed their way of doing business. They simply operate content farms and use ad advertisement to attract people who want to make easy money. So I saw this in action actually last year. When I entered a group of people who distribute all these things information for money. They got the money from China. And I was astonished, and but interesting, because after Facebook blocked all these content from articles in Taiwan, these people who wanted to make money out of it started to sell the fan pages to me. So it's like, I think, 80,000 followers for 2,000 US dollars. It's not, it's not that bad. But I report that to Facebook, so they delete all these like, fan pages again. So this leads to Model A. Is a great business, I mean, for all these people. And this is why, I mean, they have Chinese donation QR codes, as I just mentioned on the YouTube channel. So in this business model, this information flows from China to Taiwan. Hence, it is not that important to investigate who produced the messages or to identify those who are innocent that distribute all the messages. What is important is here is who established this business model. And that is who is the middleman or the agents here. And they could do that in every country. So for example, recalling the IG posture, uh, the, they put their, the, their fist on their chest, the, the case I just mentioned. It is the company that matters. The company asked live stream platforms to disseminate biased information. And this company, which is actually invested by a Chinese company, brought a project from a Chinese local office and informed Taiwanese people or overseas Chinese people to do the distribution stuff. And this idea may not be new to Taiwanese people. So this, uh, uh, so this is a famous YouTuber, Ho Ge Chen, you, you might know him. He's on the right, on the left, that's me. So, I mean, <laughs> who, I mean, I got Kurt, who just won Oscar? Right? So, I mean, uh, so the, I, I mean, the Ho Ge Chen told me that during the live stream, that Chinese government approached him last year, saying they are willing to pay him 160,000 US dollar as a down payment in order to switch his anti-China position, combined with a monthly fee of 50,000 US dollars uh, for six months. So this kind of work does not need any disinformation production. The YouTuber is simply being asked to keep quiet, and if he needs, to, if he needs any pro-China messages, they are everywhere on the internet, having been produced by China, and there's a cyber force. So this is what I call the decoupling process. And this leads me to another uh, type B case. Um, I might talk about that maybe during Q&A because it's complicated. But people who have strong political motivation to spread this information can also distribute this information through social media without the help of the business model. So that leads me to the second model, the political model. This channel is more direct but less effective since they are not familiar with Taiwanese linguistic usage, and that leads us to the second. And, and that leads to us to the example. But I'll just talk about the conclusion here because. Uh, I think I'm kind of out of time. 
So the so the so for example, we trace six YouTubers receiving the content from the same Taiwanese YouTubers who used to live in China, and this YouTuber acquired the content from a travel agency in Taiwan, a travel agency that also organized the cheap trips from Taiwan to China. So there are the channels that delivering all this content to Taiwanese YouTubers, and then they use all the same infrastructure and. They even have the same errors on their subtitles, so it, that, that's why we spot them at the very first place. So, and if there, and another case is here that if they share too many, like I mean, on the P2P system, so some of the engineer, the Chinese engineer we spot, they enter the P2P message group system and they try to kick the contender out of the group and transform the group into another group to purify it. So also making sure people in the group can be brainwashed. So they are also capable of extending the target audience by providing the scams and collecting other account information to create a new P2P the chat group. So the engineer we spot <clears throat> when they try to purify the, the line chat group in Taiwan, we successfully added him to the chat, so we actually know them. And it turned out that the engineer could not read phonetic characters, so it's Zhu Yingwen in, in Taiwan, so I mean, I mean Chinese people cannot read that. So the characters only Taiwanese can read, and when we search for his cover photo online, it looked like it was a picture taken in Fujian, a province in China. And, and this, uh, so I will skip the last model, is political warfare, because I think CSIS is very familiar with political warfare stuff, and that's the huge difference from the Chinese model with the, uh, the Russian model, because sometimes they build up their information warfare upon the political warfare system. So they try to use the push and pull strategy, something like that, we can explain that later. But let me end it with a side story about what happened after the election. So this is one, just one of the political warfare model we drew. So as you can see, there are like several figures, organizations, they are all connected and connected to some organizations there in China. And they are responsible for spreading all this disinformation right there in Taiwan. And I believe there are like so, a lot of organizations like them, I mean, here in the US. But let me share there a very, I mean, I mean 30 seconds, a very short story about what happened after the election. So there's a new face group group in Taiwan. So created after the election called Han Supporter Han support parents and me. So it means that your parents support Han Guoyu, and if you support Tsai Ing-wen, you're kind of divided. So in this group, people tell stories about how parents and their children are separated, and some youngsters are even not allowed to go home because of different ideologies their parents have. But sadly, we have identified several cyber force from China, and they're, they're writing fake stories in this group, trying to generate, generating this kind of hatred right after the election. But they stop that because of coronavirus. I mean, so, so I mean, this scenario being divided by ideologies has never been this serious before. And I'm truly worried about this division. So everyone should be, have different de opinions in a democratic society, but hatred is another thing. So I believe this is a huge challenge, not just for Taiwan, but also for the whole world. Um, for the whole world. So that ends my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, got to turn it on. I'm about to talk to you about technology. <laughs> um, so yeah, I guess I should say Dagaiho, Gaoza. Good morning. Um, excited to be here. Thank you, Bonnie and Jude, for having me, and all of CSIS. I actually used to live in the neighborhood, so it's fun to be back. Um, yeah, I'm really honored to be here on a panel with uh, Minister Tang and Dr. Shan and everyone else here. So um, uh, hopefully, it's worthwhile. Hopefully you learned something. Uh, I'm Nick Monaco. I am the uh, research director at the Digital Intelligence Lab, which is a, a think tank based at Institute for the Future in Palo Alto, California. Um, and what we do is specialize in studying disinformation and election integrity. Um, so we've produced case studies of uh, state-sponsored trolling that we uh, did in tandem with um, partners uh, as a research project. We have also did case studies on the 2018 midterms on disinformation and harassment of uh, social groups and issue publics. Um, so you can find all our stuff online. It's free. We have a Medium blog. I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, this is a project that is close to my heart. Most recently, I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about uh, a project on disinformation that we're doing on the Taiwanese elections, as you probably guessed. Um, but I lived in Taiwan about seven years ago, and uh, in a former life, I was a linguist. 
Um, so it's kind of a fun intersection of my interest to be working on uh, Taiwan and disinformation. So I just wanted to open with this um, statement from the uh, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Of course, they released their um, doomsday clock uh, prediction or uh, assessment uh, a few weeks ago. But what struck me about their assessment, uh, in addition to being closer than we've ever been to doomsday, uh, 100 seconds away, uh, is that they also, in the first paragraph, mentioned that disinformation was one of the reasons that they were moving the clock closer than it had ever been to you know, doomsday. Uh, and crucially, the, the key crises that um, uh, inspired this are the nuclear crisis and the climate crisis that we're both facing right now. And they said that disinformation has the power to amplify these crises and actually make them more of a threat than they would be uh, in, in the first place, if you can imagine that. So I think this is uh, kind of a sobering thing to realize. A lot of stuff has changed since I started studying bots and disinformation in 2015, five years ago. Uh, the platforms are notably paying a lot more attention. Governments are notably paying a lot more attention. But um, this is sobering nonetheless to uh, see you know, people I trust, scientists who are saying disinformation actually presents maybe a greater threat than we're aware of day to day. Uh, I'm sure I don't need to tell most of you in the room about this, but in the disinformation community, uh, August 2019 was really kind of a watershed moment for us. Uh, a lot of us in the disinformation research community have been waiting for uh, China to be unveiled or to be attributed as a disinformation actor uh, online uh, in the same way that Iran and Russia and Venezuela and so many other countries at this point have been. Uh, and indeed, in August, that did happen. So Twitter led the tech community in saying, we found the Chinese government, the PRC, behind an information operation that was uh, smearing pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong and, and, and smearing protesters. Um, and, and yeah, they came out and said these thousand accounts and then a subsequent set of a, a thousand more were um, smearing protesters in Hong Kong. Facebook subsequently followed suit with a, uh, a smaller takedown, a smaller network, and a more circumspectly worded announcement. Um, but what was exciting about this, in addition to you know having a, finally an attributed campaign to uh, the People's Republic of China was that uh, Twitter said, but don't take our word for it. Here's the data. Check it out yourself. So um, while I think that the tech community does a lot of things that are wrong and, and deserve to be corrected, I think Twitter does notably deserve praise in uh, leading the industry and proactively releasing these data sets. So at the lab, we were excited because we finally not only you know has this thing happened, but we can analyze it, we can analyze the data, and start learning about the tradecraft, about um, what was asked about earlier, what, how does China carry out information operations. So we did that, um, and then we ended up getting a little more than we bargained for using some open source intelligence techniques and analysis. We, not only did we kind of get an idea for how these actors were operating, but uh, we found out they were still online. So at the Digital Intelligence Lab, we found about 50 accounts that were still linked to the Chinese government. Uh, that were active on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and you can check out the analysis on our blog if you're interested in it. I mention this all because those data sets are one of several data sets that we're using in our quantitative analysis in the report that we're working on on the uh, Taiwanese elections um, today, which is the main, main topic I'll be talking about today. So uh, Digintel, my, my lab, uh, is partnering with Graphica and IRI to produce a report. Uh, on the Taiwanese elections and specifically analyzing the information sphere around the, the Taiwanese elections that just happened. So was there disinformation? Is it attributable? Uh, and and what, what's changed in the last few years? So in addition to analyzing the information sphere, we hope to um, kind of synthesize what disinformation in Taiwan has looked like historically and, and what's different now. How, is it, how has it evolved? Um, I wrote a report for Oxford in 2017 uh, on computational propaganda in Taiwan. So in many ways, this report is, is a rehash of that. That report really looked at um, the beginning of computational propaganda and digital campaigning in Taiwan. Um, and this one is focused uh, squarely on the elections. Um, we're adopting the same methodology that uh, OII uses, so mixed methods. So we're doing um, qualitative research, so a lit review, reviewing all the uh, relevant stuff that's going on in the journalism world and the academic world, expert interviews. I'm very pleased to say that uh, Minister Tang and Dr. Shun are both among the experts that we've interviewed for the project. We have about 15 so far. Uh, and then uh, on the quantitative side, we're doing cross-platform data analysis, so Facebook uh, and Twitter. Um, and these are the uh, pretty graphical maps that we've made for the project yeah, here, down here below. 
So first I wanted to talk to you uh, quickly about what we've seen on Twitter. Twitter notably is not a super important platform uh, for Taiwanese citizens themselves, um, but it is something that the uh, disinformation research community tends to fetishize, so I couldn't keep myself from seeing what was going on <laughs> on Twitter anyway. Uh, more seriously, it is uh, a place where the international conversation about Taiwan is, is happening, and uh, people who are influential both domestically in Taiwan and in, in the international sphere in Taiwan are, are thinking and talking about Taiwan, so it is worthy uh, of uh, analysis in that way. I think that um, Minister Tang can back me up on this, but it seems like the only Taiwanese people who are actually on Twitter are uh, government officials on one hand and uh, developers on the other, um, which is kind of fun. So uh, as I said, uh, so we're using three data sets on Twitter. Um, one of them is the uh, attributed Chinese disinformation data set that uh, Twitter released. There's actually two of them, so we'll, we'll count that as one data set. We also streamed uh, keywords re relating to the Taiwanese election for a month from uh, about December 11th to I think January 15th is when we cut the stream. Um, and then we're also making a graphic map, which is a third data set. If that's confusing, don't think about it at all. Just remember we're studying Twitter. Um, uh, but first, I, I wanted to highlight what is in the Chinese tweets um, relating to the Taiwanese election and Taiwanese politics at large um, that Twitter released, because this is uh, crucially one of the only, if not the only, attributed data set that we have that has been uh, attributed from a platform who are increasingly the only people who can uh, attribute disinformation campaigns, including governments. Governments don't really have that power at this point very well. Uh, so this is an attributed data set, so it's important to think about what, what's going on relating to Taiwan within this data set. Um, now, these are millions of tweets. It's a small minority, a small sliver of tweets that are concentrating on Taiwan, about 10,000. Um, but that's a non-negligible amount for um, you know, a, a data set that used to be zero. So one common pattern that we're seeing in the first data set that we've written a little bit about on the blog post I mentioned uh, is sort of promotion of smaller parties or s individuals who promote unification. Uh, and these are crucially local voices within Taiwan that promote unification. So um, to, to answer the question that uh, was asked earlier, this is something that's been seen in Russia, sort of uh, when Russia is a disinformation actor promoting views that are uh, congenial, let's say, to its geopolitical views uh, and also fringe ideologies within the societies that um, they're targeting. Um, so the New Party, which is a party that's been around for a while, which has some quite vehement pro-unification uh, politicians, one of them being Wang Bingzhong, uh, and uh, also China Times uh, TV host Huang Zixian, who is um, very vehemently pro-unification as well. So I just wanted to show you some examples of what I mean so you get an idea. Uh, this tweet is from uh, a user called at Ling Moms. I, I love the handle and I, I think I like the profile photo even more. Um, <laughs> so uh, this tweet says, it alleges essentially that Taiwan only has freedom of speech for people who support uh, Taiwanese independence, but there is no freedom of speech for people who um, support unification. I think um, my translation here might be a bit neutral. It's a little bit punchier in Chinese. Um, but crucially, this links to a YouTube video of Huang Zixian, who I was talking about just now, um, and uh, kind of debating this topic. Uh, and crucially, interestingly, in the subtitle here, we see uh, several things, but a question saying, is democracy already dead? So we see in this tweet uh, the promotion of, again, local media that is undermining faith in Taiwanese democracy and also undermining the idea that freedom of speech actually exists on the island. Uh, a similar tweet from the same user, uh, linking to a, uh, a speech of Wang Bingzhong's where he is essentially casting doubt on America's commitment to the Taiwanese relationship. Crucially, in the second data set, which was released a month later uh, and has uh, tweets uh, that are more recent. Uh, we do see tweets that are relating to the Taiwanese elections, which is very interesting. Um, there are about uh, 12, I believe, legislative candidates that are mentioned in those tweets. Um, they're crucially, interestingly, only from two parties. Uh, you guessed it, the DPP and the KMT, um, which is an interesting insight. Um, but also, most notably, there is support for Han Guoyu. Uh, there's this uh, YouTube video that they link to kind of uh, vaunting his heroic character uh, and lots of criticisms of Tsai Ing-wen's um, uh, cross-strait policy as well. Uh, this is just a quick reminder that you know, uh, Disinformation campaigns, while they might happen chiefly on one platform, uh, often implicate other platforms. So one of my um, 
one of the most interesting things I found in the Twitter data set uh, that was attributed was there was this extension that uh, you could use in Google Chrome that allowed users to tweet from 18 accounts at once, um, which is certainly against terms of service, uh, not only on Twitter, um, but basically this was something that was available in Google's Chrome store. So this extension, uh, here in Chinese it plainly says, this got taken down, but I think this is a really cool extension, so I'm going to re-upload it and uh, use it as much as you want. Um, which is crazy. This got past Google safety checks, um, and it's blunt. It's it's uh, in in plain Chinese, as it were, which is enough to get past Google safety checks. So it's something I like to highlight. Uh, Puma did a great job already highlighting content farms, particularly the very cool wavy graph that you showed us linking content farms to uh, Facebook pages. I wanted to talk a little bit about this today because this is uh, something that's, I think, particular to the Taiwanese context and to the, the Chinese language context more broadly. Um, so content farms, uh, as you'll see on the right here, this is one of the main groups that Puma highlighted in his slides. It's called uh, Qi Qi. Um, and they're basically, interestingly, sometimes they use different characters for the Qi. Um, but it is a, a template website, essentially, that you can reach through multiple domains. Uh, so basically, there are dozens of websites that have this exact same layout uh, and publish the same stories, and, and indeed publish hundreds of stories per day, um, but don't have attributable authors, or are obviously coordinated, but don't uh, from the domain or any other notes, uh, you know, note that they're commonly owned. Uh, these sites, in addition to publishing news stories that r are relevant to Taiwan, um, uh, do some of them tend to publish uh, stories that are alleging kind of a CCP geopolitical view, a pro-CCP geopolitical view of the world, much in the same way that RT and Sputnik do uh, with Russia. Uh, these two examples here are saying, you know, if China follows the, the Western system, then it won't catch up to the West even in 100 years. Another one is alleging that uh, America has uh, sent ISIS troops to Afghanistan in order to kind of stir up trouble in Xinjiang. Um, so fairly serious stuff and, and quite interesting. What's very interesting about these, um, and I'm excited because it's the first time I get to talk about this, some of these uh, domains will show that they are offline. They'll say, oh, it's a 404 error from the server. Can't find the resource. Actually, if you look into the code, it's a 301 error. It's not a 404 error. And it, 301 says resource permanently moved. But in the HTML, so the website itself is uh, an online website that's saying, tell people we can't find this resource. Say it's a 404. Uh, and what's interesting about this is um, uh, it's, it's fascinating. I've never seen this happen before. But uh, crucially, this website is still online. You can still look at its HTML. And most importantly, and I'll talk about this in a bit, uh, you can see the Google Analytics code that is linked to the website, which is a way of at attributing who it belongs to. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how these content farms are, are used. Sure, there's, there's different domains that are um, you know, putting out the same stuff. Does that really matter? And in fact, it does. Uh, basically, these domains will be up for about a month. Uh, they will then go offline and be shifted to new domains. So there's a constantly uh, regenerating set of websites that are pushing these stories. Uh, and they're crucially all owned by the same person, although if you don't do forensic work, you might not know about that. The websites themselves are just one component. Uh, they are then circulated on Facebook. Uh, pages, sets of pages will be promoting this content, as Puma uh, pointed out. Uh, and then they circulate online as well. And I do want to highlight that uh, a lot of this work has been uh, covered in great detail by a local Taiwanese news outlet called The Reporter. Uh, Jason Leo and several uh, reporters there uh, helped inform kind of the set that I used to snowball off of and, and, and see uh, what sites are out there. So I definitely encourage you to uh, check out them. They're the leading news outlet on disinformation in Taiwan. So this is an example of content farms on Facebook. Obviously, they use the same iconography. They use the same pictures. Some of them even mix simplified and traditional characters, which no one does, except for Wikipedia. Um, <laughs> And interestingly, when you look at the Facebook pages for these content farms, uh, you'll see something like this, which says there are nine people in Malaysia who are, who are managing this site, um, which isn't necessarily uh, duplicitous, but it is, uh, it's certainly something that's not advertised. Uh, this last slide is kind of highlighting how attribution works. So in the middle, we have these Google Analytics accounts, uh, one in particular that all of these domains are using. Google Analytics accounts are something that developers can use to uh, analyze 
the traffic that's coming onto their, their website. So how many people visit per day, that kind of thing. Conveniently, if you're a developer, you can use the same analytics account to analyze a set of websites. So if you own multiple websites and you don't want to set up multiple accounts to analyze them, this is a great way to do that. Also conveniently for the research world, this is hidden in the HTML. Um, so I know, even though I don't know who you are, that you're the same person behind this set of sites. Um, so here we have a small set, not the whole set of Chi Chi News sites, but uh, quite a few of them that are using the same Google Analytics code. Interestingly, all the way on the right side of the um, this slide is something I'm quite excited about, uh, which is an IP address that several of them are also using. IP signals are not very valuable anymore. Uh, basically, in the era of cloud hosting, it's common for companies to allocate randomly, you know, a thousand sites to one IP address, so it's not the 90s anymore. Despite that, uh, the person that is, is running these content farms, for some reason, is hosting 40 sites on an Irish server, and that's it. So that's a pretty strong signal that this is indeed the same actor. Um, and I should highlight, as the reporter has, that this actor is someone who's known. Uh, it's someone in Malaysia who is a private individual who is uh, basically running these content farms uh, for profit. Uh, and finally, to close, I should... Uh, <laughs> I, I'd be remiss if I talked about disinformation in Taiwan and didn't mention that offline influence is, is just as important as online influence. Uh, my first point, I think you've all read, is to ask Puma, because he's really an expert on this, and I'm just someone who cares to highlight it uh, as a footnote to the online stuff. Um, but more seriously, uh, purchase media coverage and local media outlets. Reuters has done uh, some great work this past summer uncovering that. Um, acquisition of media outlets by pro-China figures, which is even hairier, but um, it's definitely something that's going on in traditional political warfare. A lot of people have written very compellingly on this. Bethany Allen Ibrahimian, Russell Shao, uh, J. Michael Cole, and of course Puma Shun. Um, so yeah, that's something to think about in the context of Taiwan that is indeed quite different from the U.S. and Russia, say, in 2016. Uh, thank you. I think a prerequisite for being an expert on this issue of disinformation is that you have to talk three times faster than anybody else. <laughs> so, <laughs> and therefore, you will see that that's not my area of expertise because I talk a little bit more slowly. Uh, I'm just going to make um, a few comments about why this whole issue of Chinese interference uh, in Taiwan and in Taiwan's elections uh, is of interest to the United States. So as, as I look at uh, China's uh, objectives, I, I, I'm going to outline four that I think are uh, particularly salient in this regard. So first, I think that uh, China seeks to sow divisions within Taiwan's society and undermine its democracy. Uh, so this is really not new. We're just seeing new tools being used to advance this goal. Secondly, China seeks to increase uh, support for particular candidates that favor closer ties with Beijing. And we saw some work that was done uh, in the uh, mayoral local elections that took place, uh, the creation of a fan page for Han Guoyu and Facebook that, uh, uh, that became very popular very quickly is just um, one example. Um, Thirdly, China seeks to undermine the legitimacy um, of any, any administration in Taiwan that does not support its view of the 1992 consensus or that Taiwan and mainland China belong to the same country, the sort of core principle. Uh, so clearly, the Chinese want to undercut the DPP administration, its legitimacy, and uh, weaken support for President Tsai Ing-wen. And then finally, through the use of psychological pressure, uh, China seeks to create, I think, a sense of despair among Taiwan's citizens so that they will conclude that their best option is to support unification with China, and the sooner the better. And this is really very, very worrisome. These goals um, are, are, are contrary to American interests. A, a healthy, vibrant Taiwan uh, democracy is advantageous to the United States and to all democracies around the world. The US benefits when the people of Taiwan have confidence in their government and they can freely choose uh, their government representatives. 
So we know Taiwan is a target of PRC disinformation and cyber attacks year round, but, but especially around uh, elections. And, and there's, there's some evidence of election interference um, that I heard about in November of 2018, um, unclear how extensive. I look forward to learning more about how much interference there was in the recent elections in, uh, in uh, January. Election <clears throat> security is critically important in Taiwan as in other democracies, including our own. And of course, Taiwan uh, took measures to counter PRC information operations and cyber operations in the run up uh, to the presidential elections. And I believe that their efforts yielded some positive results. As many of you know, Taiwan is the target of an unusually large number of uh, cyber attacks. So this issue was addressed uh, by um, the Director General of Taiwan's Department of Cyber Security uh, when he indicated last year that uh, Taiwan's government networks are scanned 200 million times um, and suffer 30 million attacks per month from outside Taiwan's borders. And China is, is suspected of being responsible for half of those. In addition to being a target of Chinese cyber attacks for the purpose of stealing trade secrets, intellectual property, and valuable data, Taiwan's a useful laboratory for the Chinese Communist Parties to test its methodologies and technologies that can be used uh, against other countries. So all democracies benefit when Taiwan can protect itself and also share its knowledge uh, of PRC cyber activities and influence operations. Taiwan can help other countries to enhance resiliency and ensure the integrity of their policy making process. So what are some of the steps that the US is taking to strengthen uh, Taiwan's resilience and to bolster cooperation between Taiwan and the international community on cybersecurity? Last October, the US held joint offensive and defensive cyber exercises with Taiwan, uh, along with a dozen other countries. Um, and that exercise included simulated attacks on Taiwan's financial institutions and government websites. Uh, training sessions were uh, provided to enhance resiliency. Uh, the exercises provided Taiwan with an opportunity to share its experience uh, in network security. And at the opening of those exercises, the director of the American Institute in Taiwan, Brent Christensen, said, and I quote, the biggest threats today are not troops landing on the beach, but efforts by malign actors to use the openness of our societies and networks against us. They spread disinformation to advance their political agenda, and they sow division in society in an attempt to make democracies ungovernable, end quote. The US has also brought Taiwan into the Department of Homeland Security's automated indicator sharing system, which enables sharing in real time of a new threat. So for example, um, the sender address of a phishing email can be widely circulated in real time. And that means that adversaries can only use an attack once, and that increases their costs and ultimately reduces the prevalence of uh, cyber attacks. Um, so far, the US and Taiwan have held three digital economy forums to advance the deployment of secure and trusted 5G networks to collaborate on technology standards, foster an open data economy, facilitate cross-border data flows and privacy, promote application of best practices on data transparency, and strengthen cybersecurity of the technology industry and its supporting infrastructure. Now, these steps are hopefully just the beginning. Going forward, the US and Taiwan can work together more closely to strengthen our democracies against external threats. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Um, so we'll just do some Q&A up here for, for a few minutes, and then we'll open it up to the floor. if I can ask you uh, a question. And as I was listening to you and Puma give your great presentations, I kept thinking that there's, um, there's somewhat of a, a tension 
at least in my mind, that seems to exist in, insofar as raising awareness about the threat, but not undermining uh, belief in the integrity of our electoral systems. Um, so I wanted to know, you know, you were just at this event on Friday at Georgetown where you were talking about election integrity. I wanted to know within the community that's working on this, is this tension also present? And how are people talking about, again, these two dual missions or dual mandates of making sure belief in the underlying democratic institutions are robust, but at the same time, people understand that, that there is a threat? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something I think about uh, quite a lot. I was back in, uh, I'm from Missouri. I'm from a small town in Missouri. And I was back home last year um, giving a talk at my local uh, Rotary Club and Sunrise Optimist Club uh, about what I've been up to since I left high school. And um, basically talking about this, this disinformation thing. And I got a lot of questions after I was done talking that were along the lines of, uh, well, everything's false. I don't know what to believe anymore. Fox isn't true. CNN's not true. And so essentially, there was this really dejected uh, attitude about you know, not being able to know if anything is true, which is really not, not you know, the message that the research community or the <laughs> activist community uh, is wanting to send it all, and I think is maybe more pernicious than the initial threat of disinformation in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so I started thinking about this, and when I have the opportunity to talk to journalists about this problem, this is uh, definitely a tension I like to highlight, and I like to encourage them to, um, you know, and, and this is a tough thing to say, I know, but uh, you know, try to find uh, positive ways to end the stories that are about this kind of stuff, either by linking to uh, fact-checking organizations or, or, or telling citizens what they can do to proactively empower themselves. I'm really glad you asked me this question because uh, it's a good plant to plug uh, <laughs> Minister Tang's program that is teaching um, Taiwanese children and, and Taiwanese youth how to spot, not only how to be literate in media, how to read media, offline, but how to spot fake domains, how to spot bots online, how to uh, know if something's suspicious online. There are a lot of very basic things you can do um, to, to understand quite quickly whether a domain it was, uh, let's say, created within the last 30 days, um, if it doesn't have the green lock and it doesn't have a, a certificate from an authority, that probably means that you're more likely to not only suffer attacks, but have uh, less reliable information. Um, so stuff like that. So this is something that uh, Minister Tang has rolled out in Taiwan that uh, I love to promote because it crucially has a digital literacy element to it. Um, and then something that we're interested in doing at the lab um, is kind of bridging the gap between the investigative journalism community on one hand uh, and the open source intelligence, uh, online investigation research community on the other. These are really flip sides of the same coin, right? At its core, it's a, a set of skills about knowing how to interrogate a suspicious actor and how to figure out who's behind something. Um, but they get used in quite different ways, and I think that uh, both the journalistic community and the open source intelligence community could benefit uh, from more uh, communication between those worlds. And at large, citizens will be more empowered to know how to uh, not only uh, spot, but investigate suspicious content online. The hope there is that uh, they feel empowered to know what's true when they see it. Yeah, Puma, I wonder if I could ask you, um, I, you referenced a slide that I think it would take too much to get back to it, but that was the <laughs> types of rumors that were, mm -hmm. were spreading. You said we'd come back to the presentation. And I had at, put down here a question I wanted to ask you was about, um, and this is a pronged question. Um, first of all, could you go through what some of these, uh, what some of the more uh, popular topics of disinformation are? But I guess at a more sort of metaphysical level, what do we know about online virality? in the sense of, are there sort of essential features of virality that cross-cut, whether across Taiwanese society, or maybe Nick, you could help answer this as well, globally, um, do we understand how sort of these, using the metaphor, these viruses uh, spread? Are there characteristics mm -hmm. uh, that we can sort of localize and, and essentialize? Mm -hmm. I mean, because there are like a lot of like rumors like during the election. Uh, so there are like several examples. For example, there's a rumor talking about how Tsai Ing-wen, I mean, the president, got abortion for like six times. So, and that video, and actually the video has like six different versions on YouTube, and it attract like three million views on YouTube. And eventually, when we reported, I mean, on the news and to Google, and they took down like four of them, but still you can search it on, on YouTube, and the, this information is right there. So. One of the rumors is that creating a scheme and saying that uh, Tsai Ing-wen got abortion because she got affairs with former President Li Denghui 
and that's why he supports Taiwanese independence, something like that. And these people tend to believe this kind of stuff, because, and people tend to believe what they want to believe. So that's the scheme that they would really want to spread. And the graph I just indicated is that they first try to denounce the main media first, because they, want, they, want, they don't want you to do the fact check. So if they denounce the main media first, and then they can spread this kind of disinformation. And also, but I mean, for lots of rumors, they are not fake news. They are actually real news. So for example, in July, um, during the game between the US and China, the trade war stuff, they try to uh, disseminate this kind of news articles, uh, especially from Qi Qi Kai Xin Wen, one of the, the domain names that Nick just mentioned. So they try to spread this kind of news uh, in the uh, WeChat, uh, WeChat group and LINE group, and saying that there are like lots of homeless people right now in the US. And I mean, you can always find the news talking about homeless people here in the US. It, 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 it's not fake news, it's real news. But they try to frame that kind of narratives, alternative narratives, and let the people feel that the American is kind of devastating right now. And we, they cannot compete with, the US, uh, with China, and China eventually will win again. So after like, the brainwashing for like a month, and whenever if China, uh, Taiwanese government has a deal with uh, the US, and people will think that, hey, we should not be that close to the US. We should link to China because of that ideology. So they try to create this kind of like cognitive bias. So I mean, so that's why, I mean, back to the first question just asked Nick, it's about when, when I try to wear, I mean, raise the awareness, especially in Taiwan and talking about this kind of issue, I got lots of criticism because it seems like oh, uh, raising this kind of awareness will also destroy democracy. Because people tend to disbelieve each other. They will say that, hey, you are fake news. I'm not fake news. So, I'm, so that's why we're trying to do some experiment and trying to spot, because I see it as a war. I want to know that which group of people is more vulnerable to this kind of Chinese effort. So that's why we first categorize all these different topics and see how they uh, spread on Facebook or Twitter or IG, and who are the people reading this kind of fake news or disinformation, and whether they are affected, how their logic flows. And we're doing, um, actually we did like 5,000 surveys, and we haven't analyzed it yet, but we'll know in the future whether which group of people has been targeted by Chinese government, and we will know what to do. So it's not about just raising awareness, I mean, for the whole public. It's about helping people who are vulnerable to this mm -hmm. kind of disinformation, who can easily mm -hmm. generate this kind of cognitive bias, and if we can help them, we can strengthen the, our democracy. Nick, can I ask you about that, the second part of this, which is on the virality do we know, and I think looking, you're, you're looking globally as well, do we know what makes something the essential features of it, or is it a, a virality, or is it magic sauce? Um, <clears throat> a, a little bit of both, I would say. I mean, um, I, uh, Dean Jackson at the National Endowment for Democracy has, has done a lot of great white papers on this, and um, some of my colleagues from actually Digintel, Sam Woolley and Katie Joseph, just wrote a paper at the NED uh, on the psychology of disinformation. So essentially, uh, the things that tend to go most viral um, are things that really get you viscerally, things that uh, make you react and think, uh, and things that are crucially you know, quite short, uh, punchy headlines, memes, things like that. Um, so I, I would defer to them on, on the psychology of that stuff. Um, but on, on the science side, it's actually quite, it's one of the most challenging quantitative social science problems to understand when something is about to go viral. Um, Graphco, where I used to work, uh, has a tool that, that does this quite well called the Contagion Monitor, um, uh, which is uh, really interesting, but uh, this is uh, nonetheless one of the, the central questions in quantitative social science that I think has yet to be answered. Um, so yeah. Building on that, question for both of you is, um, again, as I was listening to your presentations, um, one thing I have a hard time wrapping my head around is how effective disinformation is. Um, after President Tsai's re-election, I saw a lot of headlines saying China's disinformation campaign failed, to which I thought, I'm not quite sure I, I agree with the premise there. Yeah. Um, so what, what do we know about measuring effectiveness of, of disinformation? Um, and I think the sort of meta question there is, or the important question is, do we, can we measure um, how it affects uh, the sort of underlying belief in democratic institutions, or can we only measure effectiveness on one specific post on one specific issue? Yeah, it's, uh, it's the biggest gap in the disinformation research community, I would say, right now. Um, it's a very important question. I think it's central to knowing how to combat these things. 
Um, but essentially, yeah, it's a gap. I was at a, a conference at, at Georgetown last week, and um, uh, Patrick Day, who led, uh, I think, uh, Senator Feinstein's investigation to Cambridge Analytica, uh, mentioned a couple studies that Cambridge Analytica engineers had sent him um, to, on you know, the effectiveness of advertising and, and the effectiveness of psychographic targeting. Uh, which, what's unclear is whether these were, um, uh, this is kind of a corporate line, this is what people are supposed to send people who ask, uh, or if it was uh, you know, real sound research. Um, so it's, it's a remaining gap um, in the community for sure, and it's something that needs to, uh, hopefully we'll figure out. <laughs> who any work you're doing on that of, of measuring effectiveness? Uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, the best way to measure the effectiveness is that let all things happen and do nothing, and then we can measure the effectiveness. <laughs> but I mean, that's not- That's China's right. strategy yeah, too. I know, yeah, so, but I cannot risk that. So I mean, there's always, I mean, neutralization. So we, so we always talk about the, the Russia interference within the US election in 2016. But there's also like another story talking about like how Google manipulated the search agent, search, uh, the search bias, and let Hillary got more votes, I mean, for the dem Democrats. So I mean, there's always like, uh, countermeasure like from civil society or even from other companies that will neutralize the other, I mean, foreign influence, especially here in the case of the Chinese influence. So that's why it's very difficult to us to measure the effectiveness. However, uh, the experiment I just talked about is like, uh, we're kind of, we're categorizing all this Chinese information into 16 different topics. So, and we think that there are 16 different categories there. And then we can use the machine learning to ask the machine to detect what kind of topic it is, and what kind of strategy they are trying to deploy. So whenever there's a new story come out, we can determine whether this is from China, or what is the writing style, it is whether it is from Taiwan Affairs Office, or United Front Work, or even from PLA. But, so this kind of work is that, uh, first we can detect all these, we have the tools that we can detect this information. But another thing is that with all this categorization, we can show different categories to different groups of people. And I'm thinking about doing like maybe some psychological experiment for like a thousand people there in Taiwan and trying to analyze whether they, people tend to believe which kind of strategy. But it's, it's kind of difficult because when, if we try to publish this kind of data, and China will know that, okay, this time we want to target this group of people because yeah. they're more vulnerable. <laughs> I mean, that is, uh, I mean, that's the risk we face. So I have some measures that I cannot share here that we know that there are effects, but because whenever we talk about it, they will change their strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I also wanted to add one thing. I'm glad you asked this question. Um, there is kind of my latest soapbox, I think, is there's sort of a, a frame of logic that's developing around the Taiwanese elections, which is that since Tsai won, uh, the disinformation didn't work. Uh, and I think it's analogous to the 2016 fallacy that mm. since Trump won, disinformation did work. Um, I've for years kind of been cautioning people about uh, the latter. Uh, basically, we, we know disinformation was present in the 2016 elections, but what its ultimate effect was is a research question we don't know. Um, similarly, with uh, the recent election in Taiwan, I think it's uh, uh, dangerous to think that disinformation didn't have an effect just because, say, Tsai Ing-wen won this election. Uh, we need to keep in mind that the goals uh, behind disinformation campaigns are diverse and they can be multi-pronged as well. And importantly, they can be long-term. Short-term outcomes are obviously um, something that, that foreign powers have, but um, there are long-term uh, things like undermining trust in democracy, say, or uh, sowing division that um, you know, arguably could be viewed as success from a nefarious actor. So I think it's something that's important to highlight in these conversations. I wonder whether another research question is whether disinformation can be counterproductive. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, I think, um, I think certainly, especially if, it's, uh, if, if we know who the actor is or if it's a sloppy operation. I mean, I, one of the things that was so fascinating to me about um, this attributed PRC data set from Twitter is that it was such a slapdash operation. And many people uh, in the research community, myself included, had for years been saying, oh, China is definitely engaging in this stuff, but it's just it's uh, too sophisticated to be detected. Yeah, that's my hypothesis, you know. Uh, so it's kind of jarring to see this data set of uh, slapdash uh, automated bots that were uh, targeting the Hong Kong protests because, um, again, you can check out the report if you want, but like, uh, it, was, it was very loud. There were, <laughs> there were accounts that were sending thousands of tweets per day, um, and uh, that, that had, you know, 
waited 10 years before they sent their first uh, tweet and then started tweeting hundred times, hundreds of times per day, um, or switched from Indonesian into Chinese uh, on one day and just kept doing Chinese is uh, pretty interesting. So I think that that campaign in particular uh, highlights something that Minister Tang speaks about quite often. This is, this is insecurity, right? This, uh, one of the hallmark takeaways from that data set is that this was a slapdash operation, and, and why was it a slapdash operation? It was probably because there was some panic, either at high or lower ranks within the CCP, and something needed to be done. Uh, so let's try that thing that Russia tried, and let's indeed do it in the same way. Um, uh, I don't know. It's, it's very interesting. Just, uh, uh, just final couple questions, and then we'll, we'll open up to Q&A. But um, as you were just talking, I was thinking, the, for researchers, researchers working in this space, um, a lot of the new types of disinformation seem to come out of whatever new platform there is, right? And then takes on the characteristics of that platform or exploits that platform. Mm -hmm. So working in this space and trying to anticipate future, uh, future types of disinformation, how are you able to do that when, of course, you, you don't know what the platform people will be using in two, three, four, ten years or, or do you have to, by necessity, be kind of reactive? Sure. Yeah, um, that's a great question. The future is something we think a lot about at Institute for the Future. Um, <laughs> it's a great question. I mean, uh, there is a logic behind Facebook's line that they, um, they target uh, behavior, or they remove behavior, but not content, right? When they're, when they're analyzing a campaign, they look for suspicious behavior, but they crucially won't take down content. Uh, in addition to being a convenient way to dodge the free speech issue, um, it is actually logical from a, a research perspective. So as I highlighted during the talk, um, these content farms are, uh, we, we are able to trace them to, to one actor and, and the reporter in Taiwan did a great job of that. Um, but more crucially, even if we weren't able to, the, the behavior uh, is already its own form of debunking, right? Why would someone who was spreading something that was uh, fact-checked, legitimate information that has a, a place in the free marketplace of ideas uh, be, you know, recycling domains every month, uh, a new 12 domains every month to be uh, promoting them in this suspicious way. Um, so these kinds of things are things we can expect in the future, right? Like look for uh, suspicious behavior. Um, uh, that's something that we can expect on any platform. The, the particulars of platform architecture are always a means through which uh, disinformation can be disseminated in different ways, but um, uh, we try to be on the forefront of that stuff too with studying encrypted chat apps at the lab or, or whatever it may be. Um, but much akin to cybersecurity, I mean, this is always going to be a moving target. Um, uh, detection people and nefarious actors, security teams and nefarious actors are always going to be in an arms race and someone's always going to have the leg up and that's just how it's going to be. So, um, yeah, it is, I'd be lying to you if it's not. Being proactive is part of the solution. Yeah. I think Nick answers almost all the, I mean, all the questions. <laughs> so I mean, for me, I mean, it's always risky to have like new platform because like for China, they could have certain platform to collect private information and has another platform to disseminate this information. However, like TikTok or WeChat, these platforms are capable of doing both. So they can collect the private information and then disseminate this information at the same time. So I mean, this kind of like new platform, like China is really good at investing. Mm -hmm. So whenever there's a new platform and then there's a Chinese investment behind it, that will be very risky for us. However, I mean, we can always go back to like a traditional rumor. I mean, all these offline disinformation still work even mm -hmm. without all this technology, but they can amplify mm -hmm. what already happened locally there. And back to the question about the counterproductive, I'll just like share like, um, uh, some insights here is like um, China does not really understand Taiwanese in my opinion. So that's why I, they, I mean sometimes they do not know what to disseminate this information systematically. So that's why they try to use the business model to attract Taiwanese people to do that. Mm. But if you are using that kind of business model, you have to think of what kind of people will be attracted. Mm. I mean people, if they can like earn money, I mean they can uh, they have their own expertise, they are doing great there in Taiwan, they don't need the money from China to do this kind of business. So that's why lots of fraudsters, I mean, these are like, for me, sometimes not criminals, they try to get this like, project from China, mm. and they even lie to China. So sometimes they get the money and say that, hey, I'll spread this information here in Taiwan, but they did nothing. Mm. So I mean, these fraudsters is kind of like protecting Taiwan right now. That's why mm, it's kind of crucial uh, if 
there are people or organizations that have strong political motivations and they know how to run the business, they know how to target the all this target audience, and if they're willing to collaborate with Chinese government. For example, there are some companies there in Malaysia operated by Taiwanese, they are capable to do, to do that. So if they're collaborating with China, and that will be a very mm. like, a huge issue for us too. Their, their disinformation operation will be upgraded in mm. sense. This the final question, I'd love to hear your, both of your thoughts on this. You know, thinking into the future, if we do come up with a, I was going to call it a victory, but it's probably more a status quo um, and a sustainable one of containing the problem of disinformation. Looking back, what will the elements of that victory have been? I like that framing. <laughs> um, uh, I think that uh, there are a few things I would like to see. Um, one of them is just transparency of automated agents online, transparency of bots online, uh, because we're not going to get rid of bots. Bots are an, a key infrastructural element of uh, mm -hmm. the internet insofar as you know, they, they make Google work how it works, say. Um, but a place like Wikipedia has, uh, by default, decided to make uh, bots transparent so that they can you know, do the things that humans don't want to do or can't do and that they're good at, but not, um, you know, say, spread rumors under the, the pretense of being a human. So I think that's, that's one of them. Um, I think that uh, this also might be an answer to your last question about you know, countering future disinformation campaigns, but just no-nonsense uh, legislation, and I'm not even talking about regulating speech, but things like um, we here in the United States a few years ago, Jeff Flake uh, penned some legislation that repealed Obama-era privacy uh, legislation. Uh, that essentially enables uh, big telecoms to sell uh, their consumers' data. Uh, so ISPs can sell any data they want to. Uh, this happened in an environment that was post-Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and we also know that uh, the successors to Cambridge Analytica, Ameridata, one of the, the several companies that came out of the ashes, uh, said explicitly to the Financial Times, you know, we are going to procure as much data as we can on people to micro-target them in elections all <coughs> around the world. Uh, we really want search queries. We really want Google search queries. So uh, this is an easy way for them to do that. So uh, yeah, I would say bot transparency uh, and just like basic understanding uh, that gets transformed into law about cybersecurity stuff. Yeah, and, and I think there's like a minor victory right now. It's like we're we're good at um, I mean doing the transparency stuff. So try to expose all these Chinese influence and. I mean, raise the public awareness, and then, like our government, within maybe two hours or six hours, they can respond to all this disinformation. That's the victory. But, but like I said, I mean, our society has never been divided in this way because of all this technology in the filter bubble with all this Chinese influence. So, what we should do, like right now, is that for me, because we try to pass the law and try to ask people, like organization or people who try to. Uh, doing business with China and spread the disinformation, we need them to register. So we need the Taiwanese version of Bora, but haven't been passed yet. So, I mean, for me, we're always like prevent the worst from happening. Mm, so I won't point like a victory right now, but, but we still have some minor stuff. And we try to archive all the data, and right now we'll be able to trace all the message flow. And we do know that some political warfare. Uh, I mean, United Front Work Associations are trying to spread this information. We spot them, and that's a good thing. And the IG posture I just mentioned, we respond to that in like an hour, so people know that. And these are like great things, but still, like five million people mm -hmm. may not agree with us. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left, so uh, welcome. Uh, one single question. Um, sorry, I think you had your hand up first. The third row. Uh, well, one second, sir. We'll just have a microphone coming. Uh, thanks, uh, Nathan Levine, the Asia Group. Um, so, for Puma and Nick, I'm curious um, if you saw any moves by Facebook or other social media companies ahead of the Taiwanese elections that were effective in, in helping stop dis disinformation or not? Yeah, I mean, Facebook is in. I mean, for me, a lot of stuff. Uh, so we try to report, like, so we try to investigate all these content form and whether where they're registered and who are operating and who is writing articles. So I'm actually in that group writing. Uh, I'm not writing articles, but we, I see them writing articles. <laughs> so, I mean, so we try to report that to Facebook and telling them that this is foreign influence. So I think um, 
there are like lots of content from articles are you cannot like paste it on Facebook right now in Taiwan you cannot even paste the link the URL uh, <coughs> uh, from Messenger so that's why I said that these people who try to make some easy money they cannot even distribute all these content from articles on Facebook and that's why they first they sell their fan pages to me and then they turn to YouTube so that's why I mean YouTube is uh, they try to take out the political ads so mm. you cannot really make money from all this political um, content but still because it's very easy for them to use some third company or the, the WeChat Pay or Alipay I just mentioned to earn some money so that's why you cannot really prevent them from posting all this disinformation on YouTube but Facebook is definitely do lots of stuff but what, I'm, what I imagined uh, last year was that whenever we report that I mean this kind of uh, content from articles with this information, they could flag it and let people know that this is, there might be some articles or some disinformation from China. But what Facebook did is just deleting them and prevent, preventing them from posting. So it's kind of a different strategy. Yeah. Um, I think something that's definitely a success story in this election uh, was coordination between private companies and the government and civil society. Um, so Taiwan uh, is, I think it's fair to say, has the most lively and thriving uh, civic tech sector in the world. It's really an engaged civil society that uh, produces democratic tech and tech for good. Um, it's, it's encouraging to see them empowered and being listened to by the platforms and by the government and all three of those um, those parties kind of engaging in, in, in trying to combat this problem together. I think that's crucial, and I think that's also what success in the future looks like. Uh, there was an interesting, uh, there was a takedown to some extent of some pro Han Guoyu groups in Taiwan, which I think probably everyone in the room is familiar with. Something I'd be curious to interrogate is why there was no English language kind of coverage or official mm -hmm. blog post about that stuff. Um, <clears throat> from, from what I understand, uh, this was a violation of community standards and something that was uh, basically a, a routine maintenance. Um, but why there wasn't a, an English language post about that um, is, is interesting to me. Um, so that'd be something I'd be curious to inter interrogate as a journalist. Uh, it appears that Facebook talked to Taiwanese media because Taiwanese media was covering you know, the numbers and the date of the takedown and stuff like that. But um, in the Western world and in English language, say, there wasn't any coverage of that. So I'd be curious about uh, what's going on there. It's great, the young woman in the back, second row from the back. Thank you, hi, I'm Sherry Huang. I'm a cyber threat analyst with Recorded Future and my question is for Professor Shen. Um, could you please share more about the middleman companies that you mentioned that employ Taiwanese uh, Instagram and YouTube influencers, mm -hmm. specifically um, what type of companies they are and what their connections with China are? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So they're live streaming platform and they, and some of their, I mean, uh, I call it like internet celebrities could have maybe 100,000 followers to maybe 200,000 followers. And this kind of company, so first uh, the company uh, is invested by China for sure, that's the case. And then another evidence we collect is that they actually bring the YouTubers in Taiwan to China to do the training. Yeah. So, but I cannot name the company because I will be sued by that. <laughs> I mean, that's the connection we found. And then you might be curious what is the training cr program there in China. And it is actually run by um, a member of CPPCC. So that's how we connect that to the Chinese influence. And there are actually two companies. <laughs> Great, sir. Uh, third row in, in the maroonish. I think that's maroon, and I apologize if it's not. That's what I'm saying, too. Uh, thank you. This is Steve with the Formal Sem Association for Public Affairs, Papa. And my question is when you attribute the uh, disinformation back to TAO or uh, UN Framework Department and MPLA, do you see the difference in tactics and disinformation content uh, being employed by these three agencies? Thank you. Uh, there's definitely a difference between uh, different platforms because I think different, they have different cyber army or like different cyber force for different platforms. <laughs> Actually, people who uh, are good at operating all these uh, articles posting on Facebook, they are not good at making videos on YouTube. So that's why they are like kind of different. But uh, so it, it's kind of they are distributing their content in a very different way. But however, they receive the content from the same channel. So it's centralized and decentralized in a way. 
So they receive this. There's a, like a propaganda in the world that asks them to do certain kinds of disinformation. But like every organization, like here, all the um, PR firms or the marketing groups there, they have different strategies for sure. So for example, you could see a lot of fake news on the P2P messaging groups. These people are really good at like producing this kind of scheme and fake news. I mean, more than half of them are just fake news. But if you look at YouTube, lots of them are. I just mentioned the real news. It's just like the framing stuff that try to provide alternative narratives. And that's the different strategy that applied from YouTube. However, if you look at, when you look at the live streaming on YouTube, there's a, people could comment, right? I mean, on the right side or on the left side of the live streaming. I think this group of people are provided by different companies because they are kind of low. <laughs> and like, there's even several times we spot them that said, hey, we need to switch the concept and continues, something like that, in simplified Chinese. So I mean, they might be operated by different groups of people, and I believe they're more connected to uh, Gong Qingtuan, Communist Youth of League. Yeah. But the YouTube channel uh, itself is not connected to, to Communist Youth of League. So it's, like, it's very complicated. Uh, it's a very brief way to answer your question. Mm -hmm. Turn the, the back row the farthest row over there. Hi, uh, Adam Cozy from uh, CrowdStrike. Uh, thank you for volunteering your time today. Um, yeah, I actually just wanted to follow up a little bit more on that question about attribution, um, because I think it's important, uh, that as you were talking about finding out who the middlemen are, that's, that's great from a, a strategic perspective, because you can kind of deal with mercenary groups, essentially, that are, that are kind of uh, you know, providing the funding for those sorts of things. But um, for the coordination, uh, how much coordination do you see between uh, the different groups that, that he had just mentioned, uh, United Front Work, MSS, PLA, um, as far as that, the propaganda coming from a centralized location, how much coordination do you see about that being disseminated, who's providing the coordination, and how do you see that improving in the future um, if they were to improve? So I mean, so I mean, Twitter and Facebook always like like to like, like mention the standard called coordinated inauthentic behavior, the CIB. So it's much easier for us to find inauthentic behavior, but sometimes they may not be coordinated. And the, I mean, the thing is that because there are like so many departments right now in China that are responsible for this kind of disinformation uh, uh, distribution. So the PLA, the, the strategic. <coughs> support forces might be responsible for that. The Taiwan Affairs Office, the CPPCC member, they could just run the WeChat public account and disseminate this information. The United Front World, the Protagonist Department, the, the Communist EU of League, like all these people are responsible. And they're, they're not really collaborating with each other. They actually compete with each other. So there's one, um, so there's one case that we found that there's a department that they could not say. In China, they are not really responsible for this kind of stuff. But actually, they bribed one of the uh, marketing group here in Taiwan to ask them to disseminate all this disinformation. And I think it's because uh, that department seeing that, hey, other groups, other departments are doing this job well. So we might want to take this as a chance to make some money, so to apply for the budget from this central government's propaganda. And that's why I think their, um, all this disinformation operation may not be that successful because of this scenario. However, they are successful when they try to use the Taiwanese companies to disseminate this information. And that's very problematic. Because for us, if we were doing the machine learning, we can try to detect whether this article is written by Chinese or by, or by like Chinese cyber force. But if they're paying the, the PR firms or the marketing group there in Taiwan to do this kind of stuff, or the Taiwanese YouTubers to do that. And then because they're Taiwanese, they talk like Taiwanese, speak like Taiwanese. And if it's if we cannot find any evidence for the money flow, then we cannot prove that it is the Chinese disinformation. And that's the challenge we face mm -hmm. right now. And that's, I think, why the US really needs to be involved, because the US is really good at tracking the money <laughs> flow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would like to add something onto that, something that's super interesting about content farms as an entity and as like a model for disinformation. Um, this is, so, the the Qi Qi Kan Xin one, the uh, content farm that I highlighted, um, is crucially not only a content farm; it's also a platform. Um, so you can uh, register an account 
on some of these content farms, and they, they do identify themselves as platforms, which um, if you're a new user, you have the ability to copy and paste an article very quickly, and after you generate enough traffic for the platform, you have the ability to, to pen articles yourself. We can assume that's a pretty low bar to, uh, to accomplish. Um, what's, what's new about this is they do envision themselves as platforms, right? And so that uh, part of the logic for not taking anything off of the website, uh, even if I don't know the author, even if I don't know if the author was paid by a political party or a government, say, uh, is that uh, this is a platform, so uh, we, we uh, envision our members as having free speech. It's an interesting recycling of what uh, Western platforms are saying right now, and it's really, uh, it's novel. Um, after the reporter published an article on one of these content farms, um, Evan Lee, the, the Malaysian guy I talked to you about who was behind some of them, uh, insisted on talking to the reporter, but only via email, not in person, and basically defended himself by saying, do you want to know the name of the biggest content farm on earth? It's YouTube. Uh, what I do is you know, let people have free speech on my platform. Uh, again, this is a website that's uh, very clearly promoting certain geopolitical views and, and disinformation in several documented cases. Um, so it's, uh, it's an interesting uh, policy question, I guess, but from the attribution side more, more concretely, um, it's, it's a really tough challenge. Well, uh, I want to thank so for sticking with us for two and a half hours. I'd like to thank uh, Audrey and, and uh, Puma for coming over from Taiwan, Nick for coming in for California, and to all of you for, uh, for joining us for this really important discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks.